In this unit, we discuss how to convert alkenes into vicinal diols. And remember here that the term vicinal refers to groups that are bonded to adjacent carbon atoms. So here we have two adjacent carbon atoms and those have a hydroxy group on each of them. So we would describe this molecule as having vicinal hydroxy groups. Remember the hydroxy groups are alcohol functional groups. So therefore we refer to this as a vicinal diol where the di part there means two, OL means alcohol. So we're gonna be converting using an addition reaction the alkene functional group that we begin with to a vicinal diol. And the reagent that we'll use for this is osmium tetroxide, OSO4, in the presence of peroxide. So we'll go ahead and take a closer look at this reaction to get started. So in this reaction, what we're gonna be doing as our example problem for starters here, is we're gonna start with just a generic carbon-carbon double bond so we'll start with 2,3-dimethyl-2-butene. We're gonna react with osmium tetroxide, OSO4, in the presence of peroxide, H2O2. And what we would predict to result from this reaction is that we would, as a result of taking these reagents, our osmium tetroxide and peroxide, we would result in the addition of a hydroxy group to each of the two carbons of the carbon-carbon double bond. So in other words, we're gonna add an OH group to each of those two carbons. We won't observe any skeletal rearrangements or anything like that. So literally it's going to involve just taking and placing a hydroxy group on each of those two carbon atoms. Anytime you see we're using osmium tetroxide and peroxide. So let's go ahead and write out the product for this. Then we're gonna talk in a little more depth about the mechanism for it. So we started off with a four carbon chain and at carbon two and carbon three, we had methyl groups coming off. And now at carbon two and three, we also need to have hydroxy branches coming off as well to give us that vicinal diol product where we have a hydroxy group on adjacent, hydroxy groups on two adjacent carbon atoms. So now that we've kind of gone through how to predict the product of this, let's look at a little bit more detail regarding the mechanism for this and how osmium tetroxide also known as osmic acid, comes into play here. So at the first step of the mechanism, what's going to happen is if we go ahead and draw out the full structure for osmium tetroxide, I'm gonna go ahead and just draw my alkene molecule in here as well. I'm drawing it vertical so that we can see a little bit more easily where the electron pushing arrows go. Osmium tetroxide is going to have in the best most stable Lewis structure for this double bonds to four oxygen atoms. And you may be saying to yourself, wait a minute, that osmium has gone way over the octet rule. Isn't that a no-no? So for most of the atoms we work with in organic chemistry, such as carbons, oxygens, etc., we try to stay within the octet rule. However, some of these other elements in the periodic table, such as osmium, are able to go over the octet rule. And so that's why we are able to get away with having osmium with way over the octet here. So what's going to happen in this reaction is that the pi electrons from our alkene, much like we've seen in all of the mechanisms we looked at so far for addition reactions, in the very first step of the mechanism, the pi bond comes over and it's going to attack. Specifically, it's going to attack one of the oxygen atoms of the four that are bonded to osmium. So it comes over, forms a new covalent bond to one of the four oxygen atoms. As a consequence of that, since oxygen can't exceed the octet rule, one of those pi bonds between osmium and oxygen has to come over and it's going to end up residing on osmium since osmium is perfectly happy being over the octet rule. So that comes over and then following along, the pi bond connecting osmium to one of the other oxygens is gonna come over here to form a bond to this carbon. And so this allows us to avoid being below the octet for either of these two carbon atoms of the alkene. So we don't have to make a carbocation intermediate here because instead what we can do is we can take the pi bond from here, bring that over to grab the oxygen at the same time that this pi bond is coming down onto the osmium to make a lone pair. And this 
pi bond from the other oxygen bond comes over and attacks the other terminal of the carbon-carbon double bond. Okay, so let's draw the outcome of these electron pushing arrows that we've just shown here to illustrate what's going on. So we'll go ahead and redraw our general carbon skeleton. And now, showing in red arrows the new connections that we've made, we connected that carbon atom right here over to the oxygen of one of the oxygen of osmium tetroxide. So we'll go ahead and plug that in. That oxygen still has two sets of lone pair electrons because we haven't done anything with the lone pairs that are there. We did, however, take one of the pi bonds and move that onto osmium. So therefore, the oxygen now only has a single bond to osmium. Osmium will have an extra set of lone pairs relative to what it had initially because of that pi bond moving over onto osmium. Osmium still has a couple of sets of double bonds to oxygens that we haven't done anything with. So we're going to redraw those. So that would correspond to this bond and this bond. We've just redrawn exactly like they were. And then we come up here to our upper left corner and what we see is that there, our double bond, one of those bonds has come over to connect with the carbon of the carbon-carbon double bond there that I've highlighted. So we need to make that connection between the oxygen atom and the carbon atom. So we'll go ahead and do that. So I'm gonna go ahead and draw out our oxygen atom right here. It was bonded to osmium. That oxygen in the upper left corner still has two sets of lone pair electrons, but the pi bond has now swung over and become a bond to the carbon atom. So we'll go ahead and show that like so. So now what we have created here is we've made a five-membered ring. So we can connect through one, two, three, four, five atoms in this ringed intermediate. And that is all going to take place just through the action of the osmium tetroxide. The peroxide, H2O2, hasn't come into play yet. So this is our key intermediate in this process. And then what's going to happen is that when we add to the reaction mixture the peroxide, H2O2, what the H2O2 is going to do is enable the breakage, also known as the cleavage, of the oxygen-osmium bond to lead us to a final product that will instead have a hydrogen atom here. So we're going to break these two bonds between oxygen and osmium and replace that oxygen-osmium bond with an oxygen-hydrogen bond. We're not going to go through the mechanism for this part of the reaction and you won't be expected to know that for exams or quizzes or anything like that. But what's going to happen here is that we'll break the oxygen-osmium bond and we'll replace the osmium there with hydrogen. And those hydrogens are going to originate from the peroxide. Now, in this particular example that we've just shown, you'll notice that there are no chiral centers here or here, so we don't need to worry about stereochemistry for this particular reaction. Um, we do need to think about whether the reaction is regioselective, and just like has been the case for every situation where we have brought in two identical groups, such as two halogen atoms, to hydrogen atoms, etc., the reaction cannot be regioselective. So there's no preference for which group gets added where because they're identical groups. So not regioselective. The conversion of alkanes to vicinal dials using osmium tetroxide will not be regioselective, but we can look at a situation where we can impart some stereoselectivity. So let's take a look at that now as a second example problem here. And we're going to use a cyclic system a cyclic alkene starting material here as our starting structure. To illustrate this, we'll use osmium tetroxide. And in this particular example, rather than using our peroxide reagent that we used before, we're going to instead use sodium bisulfite, NaHSO3. And the NaHSO3 is just an alternative to the peroxide. So when you see this 
and the reaction mixture, just expect that the behavior of the reaction is going to be the same as if we'd had peroxide in there. It's just an alternative reagent to use. So what we're going to expect here is that we're going to get the formation of a vicinal diol. And we could go ahead and draw out the structure of that without stereochemistry here by just adding an OH group to each of the two carbons, like so. Then we need to think about the stereochemistry of this because in the case of this molecule, we have two chiral centers here and here, and those two chiral centers could each could correspond to the two hydroxy groups being cis to one another, the two hydroxy groups being trans to one another, or a random mixture of all of the different possibilities here. So in this situation, we would expect that the theoretical maximum number of stereoisomers using that two to the n rule would be two to the two, which equals four, because there's two chiral centers in there. And so we need to ask whether we're gonna make all four of these stereoisomers or not. So in order to address that, let's take a look at the key intermediate, the intermediate where the alkene has formed a bond, bonds to the osmium tetroxide. So our key intermediate bonded to the osmium tetroxide. We'll take a look at it and see if there's any stereochemistry constraints of that because in the intermediate we'll have two rings that are fused together and we've seen a lot of situations before where when we fuse two rings together there are some constraints about how the bonds must be oriented. So let's take a look at that. So the intermediate here which you could arrive at by using the same mechanism that we did in the earlier example problem and I'm just skipping the electron pushing arrows here and going straight to the chase with our intermediate. We'll go ahead and draw in the osmium, connect that, still have two sets of double bonds to oxygens here and here and then there would be that lone pair of electrons on the osmium in this intermediate. So we have this five membered ring right here fused to the six-membered ring of what began as our alkene. And what's going to be the case here is similar to the situation where when you had a three-membered ring coming off of another ring system, the bonds that led to the um, chlorine atom or bromine atom of the three-membered ring had to be cis to one another. And the same thing is going to be true here, that this bond and this bond have to be cis to one another, otherwise what's going to happen is that one of those bonds would need to be um, un impossibly long. And so we can show this by indicating both of these bonds as two wedges or alternatively as two dashes. So in actuality, both of these would exist where both bonds to the oxygen were wedges or as I'm drawing now, both are dashes pointed away from us. Like so. And the implication of this in terms of the stereochemistry of the product is that remember at the next step of the reaction, we bring in our sodium bisulfite or our peroxide, we're gonna end up breaking away the osmium and we're going to be replacing that with hydroxy groups. And so what's going to happen is that the two hydroxy groups are going to have to end up cis to one another. In other words, we describe this as a sen addition because they start off right here, cis to one another, here, cis to one another. So once we break that osmium off and replace with a hydroxy group, the groups, the two hydroxies are still going to be cis to one another. So we'll go ahead and write out our final product here. I'm just gonna show a couple of arrows here to indicate that there are a couple of mechanistic steps or more that go on between here and your final product. But the final product is certainly gonna to correspond to leaving those two hydroxy groups in the same orientation to one another that they were in the intermediate. So cis both pointed toward us or cis both pointed away from us as dashes. So we would certainly describe based on this information, if you're looking at this as a general reaction and ascribing some terms to it, a general term that we've used to describe addition of two groups on the same face of the molecule was a sen addition. So we would definitely describe this as being a sen addition reaction.
Remember that sin is the opposite of an anti-addition. Anti would mean that the two groups added trans to one another. Sin means that the two groups add cis to one another. And so based on the fact that the actual products that we observe from this reaction are just these two that correspond to the sin addition and not the other two possible stereoisomer products, we therefore end up with only two of the maximum four stereoisomers that are hypothetically possible. And therefore, we would definitely describe this reaction as being stereoselective because we're not making all of the hypothetically possible stereoisomers as major products. Instead, we're making just a subset of those. We're making just the cis products as our major products. So with that, we can say, yeah, this is stereoselective.